The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene. And from Boston, I'm Ed Jupin. Welcome to show 12.B of As We See It. We'll explain 12.B a little later on, but here's a clue. It's Tuesday, October 18th, 2011. No, it's not Sunday. We missed you this Sunday because we were out on a video shoot for Basenet Internet Television. So here we are on our delayed podcast. But we're glad to have you anyway, even though we're two days late. Hopefully you're still following us. And we have uh, another interesting show coming up today, I would imagine. Holly Hurley, our co-host, is off today because of our schedule change. So joining our other co-host, Fred Boaz, we have from Basenet Internet Television, our producer and host of About the Bay and our About city series, Jessica Moskowitz, who's up in the northern Silicon Valley in Berkeley, California, and uh, say John C. Dvorak does not have a patent or a copyright on saying from the northern Silicon Valley, I'm John C. Dvorak, so we're going to steal that today. From the northern Silicon Valley, we have Jessica Moskowitz. So Fred and Jess, welcome to show 12.B, and if you want to give the reason for that 12.B, Fred, go ahead, and it's all yours. Well, we do want to do, do a uh, we do want to do a show 13, but 13 being a traditionally unlucky number, we didn't want to go to show 14. So Ed and I discussed why don't we do a 12-2 or 12-B or 12.B, and that's what we came up with. So it is show 13, but it's show 12.B officially. Just that next week's show could be a show 14. 14. There you go. Anyway, welcome aboard, Jess. Uh, glad to have you. Glad to work with you. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Ed. Well, she sounds like Holly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just anyway. have to stick in a woohoo here and there, and you're out. Yeah, right. You know, we got Holly, but no, Holly is out. Is out. Is off today. She, she will she, be uh, back down... Sunday for show 14. That's it. No problem. She'll be in for show 14, and Jess is welcome too if you want to come on and join us. We'd love to have you. Cool. But anyway, let's get started with the show. It is Tuesday. We were off on Sunday due to the uh, filming. Anyway, our first story up uh, is a uh, what I consider a uh, an attaboy for T-Mobile who. I really don't like, but that's neither here nor there. A lady ran up a a woman in uh, Florida named Celia Aaron's ran up a two hundred and one thousand dollar bill from T-Mobile because of her two deaf mute brothers, who were and they're they don't want to be blamed. They can't talk. They're mute, deaf, no sound, no te- but they text. And one of them went to went to Canada, and unbeknownst to them, they had an international charge. They did over two thousand texts, giving a bill of two hundred and one thousand dollars and. Of course, she flipped out. They had two thousand dollars in data charges alone, and legally, T-Mobile was no not bound to let her know about the the had the, the ballooning and, charges. And but they don't have to reverse those don't charges to let you know. or anything. There, you're you're stuck. That's and, your responsibility. But what they did is they did cut the uh, her bill to twenty five hundred dollars and gave her six months to pay it. Apparently, it's not the first time this has happened because, uh, according to the article that I was that I've researched through a thing called the, the Atlantic Wire, they're saying that back in uh, when well, Reuters reported that a uh, a gentleman racked up thirty eight hundred dollar uh, thirty eight thousand dollar Canadian dollar bill, uh, which was negotiated down to thirty four hundred dollars several years ago. So it, there's lessons gleaned. If you have a phone bill ever gets that big, you probably won't have to pay it. But you know something, you might. Because these guys don't have to reduce the bill. Just because, you know, they went out, they went overseas or they go to Canada, it's up to you to make sure that you have the uh, scene, the, 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 the rules and everything down. But kudos to uh, T-Mobile and that's all, you know. That's, <laughs> absolutely. They did the right thing because they certainly didn't have to do that. Especially under the circumstance of the kids being deaf mutes. It's already communication, so it's the best thing they can do, and it it, it does it does give them a, a it's it's good publicity for these guys, and they really should be rewarded for it. Absolutely, congratulations, T-Mobile, for doing the right thing. Yeah, that's pretty nice of them. So anyway, but 
Now to a to a less happier note, uh, warehouse workers are at a Walmart contractor facility alleged abusive conditions. Now I want to make this clear: this is not Walmart. This right. is a contracted warehousing facility that does almost ex- exclusively Walmart products. Right. And it's apparently, in, what's that? No, I was going to say it's down in uh, Riverside County, California. Yeah, it's Riverside down in County, Southern California. California. They're handling goods bound for Walmart stores. And a group of workers has filed a uh, class action lawsuit against uh, the company itself. And please, let's understand this is not Walmart. But they, they say they've been working under abusive conditions. And uh, a gentleman named Eduardo Carrillo, and I hope I'm pronouncing his, uh, his name right, uh, five other low wage employees who worked at the Riverside California warehouse run by Walmart contractor Schneider Logistics alleged they've been routinely so, uh, shortchanged on their paychecks, required to work in dangerous hot conditions and threatened with termination when they're complaining to their supervisors. And if this is true, and I'm not saying it is or it isn't, Schneider Schneider just needs to they they need they need to they need to be sued because this is this is wrong. You yeah, and, and also uh, through the Schneider company, they're uh, also alleging improper um, record keeping is to the amount of hours that these workers were working, uh, and to throw more fuel onto the fire, these workers are primarily Latino immigrants who don't speak English. And they apparently also, in these articles we're reading, have no education beyond middle school. So I don't know about you guys, but obviously Schneider, the Schneider organization is trying to take advantage of these people that uh, have pr- basically no education, don't speak English, and they work 10-hour days and Schneider's probably paying them for a four-hour day. And what gets me is it says when workers are questioning their paychecks, their bosses routine, routinely responded with threats of retaliation and actual retaliation included by sending their inqu- uh, inquiry workers home without pay, refusing to give them work at, uh, work the next day, and imposing other forms of discipline on them. And that's just wrong. What you do you do What do you that. think, Jess? You've been How in a uh, business think- environment. How is this being allowed to even happen? I mean, I, I, I just don't understand it. I feel like somebody would have been in there busting the doors down months ago. Not letting- yeah, don't, I mean, I would have to think that these are legal workers. We hope. But if they're not, that well, may be well, if, the if they're Yeah, if they're not, that's a whole different ballgame because what I'm saying is if, I'm not saying I assume they're legal workers, but if they're legal workers, that means... Their wages are being reported to the IRS and everything, and like you just said, Jess, at some point, it's got to catch up with somebody, and somebody's yeah. got to say, hey, what's going You know, how is this warehouse operating, whether it's eight hours a day, 16 hours a day, 24 hours a day, if it's around the clock, but yet their payroll shows that they have employees working six hours a day. Well, how, the you know, how is they this may not they may not be able to do so. I mean, these people may be so intimidated because of their educational background, the fact that they only don't speak English, they may not have a resource to turn to. And these guys, I guess this young group of workers who's suing, apparently contact an attorney, and the attorney says, you guys have the right to do this. So, you know, it is, and this company has no right to do this. Wow. That's just unbelievable. Yeah, they, they um, I, I don't think we said this, uh, Part of the problem, along with the uh, the bad payroll systems, is they weren't given proper pay stubs, you know, and then they obviously weren't getting paid for the time they worked. Um, so these charges have led to an in-depth investigation of all of the companies involved here. And again, like Fred said at the beginning, as of now, this has nothing to do with Walmart. As a matter of fact, uh, Dan Fogelman, a Walmart spokesperson, uh, told Huffington Post, who is one of the articles we're quoting from, that the company, Walmart, is not involved in this matter. The contracts that we have in place, uh, this is Dan Fogelman speaking, the contracts we have in place with third parties require that they follow the law, and that's something we fully expect. So it's probably going to you know, turn out that now, there, there happened, is something uh, else in here. It says that Schneider was sued earlier this year by workers at a similar facility in Illinois who claimed they weren't paid what they were owed, which means this is getting this. So he's got a, they've got a track record to Schneider. This company looks like it's company wise. So Schneider Logistics is on our hit list anyway. And, hmm. you know, these guys, the, the labor board needs to go in there and shut these guys down. I mean, there, there's enough yeah. contract, enough people out there looking for work nowadays that, you know, they need to get these to shut these guys down. 
Okay. Yeah, I agree. It makes me think of like the subprime mortgage crisis. It's like the minute anybody comes around that's a little bit naive and <clears throat> maybe not educated enough and they're taken advantage of. Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you talk about the mortgage crisis. That was the mortgage crisis in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, you know, somebody that was making $10,000 a year, they'd finance them a $200,000 house. What did they care? You know? Well, yeah, and, the thing, and my solution to that is if you wrote the loan, you should eat the loan and let the guy keep his house. You know, but that's either here or there. I mean, how did they not know these people couldn't pay their mortgage? But, I mean, if this stuff is going on in Illinois, I'm surprised that the Illinois um, the Illinois people didn't didn't bother, did contact the rest of the offices in which these people were done. You know, which these people had offices and let them know what's going on in the investigation. But that's typical uh, of states not talking to each other. Well, they're going to now, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure it is now. Probably going to go federal at this point. All right. What else we have coming up? Jess, do you have a uh, major topic here? Yeah, I wanted to <clears throat> I wanted to talk with you guys today on the show and uh, maybe maybe bring to light some of our listeners uh, uh, some some controversy that's going on over here on the left coast. Um, you know, I'm not originally from California, and I'm actually originally from New York, so I've grown up in a, in in areas that are very urban. Um, so I've always been, you know, to this to this day, I don't drive a car. I've been without a car for the past six years now. So I get around on public transit and stuff like that. So this is really, this story is really important to me. There's this initiative going on out here called One Bay Area. And it's actually a, um, uh, a consortium of, of a number of local agencies, public agencies, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the Association of Bay Area Governments, the Bay Area uh, Air Quality Management District, so a number of um, local agencies, and they've gotten together, and what they're trying to do here is implement what's called a sustainable community strategy. So, you know, there's that buzzword, sustainable, um, and uh, so, so basically what they're trying to do is combat population growth, because we're in the Bay Area now, we're uh, some seven counties, I think, like that, not, or nine different counties, and we're uh, about to hit nine million people. And you have so, a, you're, you're, I'm not going to steal your thunder, but you have a clip coming up uh, at some point here, um, just to give a little prelude to the clip. It, within the clip, one of the people interviewed talks about how the Bay Area is the, the Bay Area freeways are the second congested in the country, second yep. only to Los next, Angeles. Next to L.A., that's correct, yep. So a lot of people out here took, took, you know, it's the American dream. It's all the space, it's all the, you know, the big backyard, it's all that stuff. I mean, that's what the, what the West Coast has kind of uh, built upon over the past, I'd say, 50 years or so. And now they're kind of all turning around and saying, well, maybe this wasn't such a responsible way to do things. Maybe we want to be a little bit more smart about our growth. Maybe we want to make more densely populated communities so that people don't have to spend so much money on gas or limit their greenhouse gas emissions getting from place to place, from, from home to work or from home to retail location. And so there's the these these agencies have been going out to the public directly to the public i've been to some of the meetings and they've been surveying them on what to, you know what do they want how do they want this sustainable community strategy to be implemented um, and some people get it they love it they think it's great we're you know we're, we're being responsible um, you know we're doing the right thing by our environment by our public by our citizens but there's this flip side. Uh, so let, actually, let's let's listen to the the clip real quickly, and then we'll go into the flip side of this, the criticism. We'll talk about why people are not so keen about this idea. 100,000 acres of open space. That's the legacy in Alameda and Contra Costa counties left by a small group of civic leaders who had the vision to preserve what is today the East Bay Regional Parks District. And when you look at the bay and how it binds us all together. Remember the three women who led the charge to save the bay. That campaign sparked a worldwide movement to save shorelines and promote public access. The result, open space and beauty that people in the Bay Area have come to take for granted. The congestion here in the Bay Area is bad. And statistics show that we are number two in the nation as having the most congested freeways. We're only behind Los Angeles. So I think clearly we have a lot of work to do. The impact of climate change has forced us to reevaluate the way we live. The big question, how to accommodate a growing population while minimizing the impact to the environment. 
One answer, Senate Bill 375. Senator Daryl Steinberg explains its origins. I think what happened was in 2006, when the legislature passed the landmark AB 32, there was a common recognition that while most of the attention is paid to alternative fuels and, and hybrid vehicles and stationary source reductions for business, that there was a big piece of meeting those goals uh, that wasn't talked about enough. And that is changing our development patterns, planning in a way that reduces the amount of miles that people have to travel to and from home to work or, again, home to, home to retail. And that if we could find a way to incentivize growth, but more compact growth, we would not only be uh, meeting or have a better chance to meet our AB 32 goals, but we would be, con we would be fulfilling that, those decades-long goals of creating smart growth or a better jobs housing va balance. One of the ways we can do that, and certainly the MTC has pointed to this as well as ABAG, is by melding transit, transportation, and land use into kind of smart urban design, urban centers where people can walk to work, where people can take public transit to work, where people can live near where they're working, and where there are public amenities that kind of will create a community that's kind of self-sustaining. So it sounds pretty good, huh? We've got all these, we've got all these some words. Some decent facts there. Some smart growth. We've got, you know, uh, sustainable. We've got green going on here. We're talking about helping the environment, making things cheaper. Uh, I love it. Well, it's good. It's good, and right? Obviously, as well, these inter in these interviews, we heard about these, uh, the senator and everything, uh, you know, putting forth these resolutions for all of this. You know, the oh, thing yeah. is, and Ed, you know, you remember when we were up in when I was up in Boston. You know, we used to we walk, we take mass transit, we take the T. We don't, we don't, we don't get a car unless we need. To. I do the same as Jess. When Jess was up in this area, I've been primarily just using mass transit, and I have one of those uh, rent by the hour type cars, and that works uh, best. Just get a vehicle that way when I need one, and yeah. So you're you're absolutely right, Fred, and. What you were saying before the clip, Jess, down in the Los Angeles area, years and years ago, back in the 30s, the 1930s, there were trolleys and what we call light rail systems today and everything, as there was in New York and even in New Jersey. Everybody had trolleys. And Los Angeles, in the 40s and 50s, when Eisenhower started the interstate highway system and all, the Los Angeles County area, Southern California in general, decided, ah, we don't need these trolleys and train systems and everything anymore. They yes. yanked them all out, and I have some pictures on my computer showing the workers, the state workers or, you know, contractors, pulling up rails and everything, and in place of the rails, they were laying interstate highways. Yep. And now what's happening, uh, Julie did some reports uh, from, you know, for us down in Los Angeles a while ago. Los Angeles now is, their metro system is growing and growing. She was telling us how they're expanding one of their systems that right now goes from the San Fernando Valley, from basically Van Nuys into downtown LA. But now they're going to expand that one west from downtown LA out to Malibu or something. So everything that they... Everything that they ripped up 60 years, they're going to reinstall now. See, part of the problem, and, and part of the problem is where I'm living, there is no mass transit. Right. I mean, if I want to get to New York, it's a $60 ride on a March bus line. And even in New Jersey, the, the mass transit is the pits. You, ha you almost are required to have a car. And I've always told people, if I could get to work by mass transit, I would use mass transit. I, you know, it, it's a pain in the ass to drive. But it, 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 it gets to the point where, you know, what they're doing is, and you know, I'm I'm one of those people. You know, we talk about fossil fuels and all this, and gasoline and oil. I'm one of those people. If I could burn ethanol in my car, I would do so. But there isn't an ethanol dealer within 30 miles of my house. Well, like Back to the Future, when you could dump any kind of garbage into. The well, yeah, and I don't have, and I would love to see that, and we have the technology to do it. But you know, we're buying we're buying oil overseas. It's called oil companies. No, well, I'm saying, but we're buying we're buying oil overseas, and you know, it's. I mean, I don't see an ethanol station two miles from my house, and I'd love to see that, because I, if, if I could convert my car to ethanol, I'd do it. 
Or electric. I, I don't know that or I'm electric. necessarily sold on the whole electric concept, but here in Boston, what they're doing now is uh, in downtown Boston, around the City Hall area, they're installing these parking meters that are also the electrical recharging stations. Oh, so like you, could, you could pay your meter, you could also stick in your credit card to... I'm just going to throw out a number out there because I don't know what it is. Five dollars to recharge your card. So you insert your credit card, and now you, while you paid for your meter, you also stick that charging thing into your car, and you recharge your car. They've actually cool installed that? those in the city hall area in Boston. How cool is that? That's great. You know, they do that yeah. out here in San Francisco in the Bay Area too. But uh, they, and if we're talking about emissions, the other thing is, is out here I've noticed, and I really like this is. Um, all the buses, all the, our Muni system is on catenary lines. It's it's electric. So apparently we're we're one of I don't know what the statistic is, but San Francisco, the Bay Area is one of the uh, uh, cities or regions with the best air quality in the country. Safe. Like, well, oh. I'm I'm gonna take that a step further because most of our listeners are relatively new listeners, so they wouldn't be aware of the base net internet television story I'm going to tell. A couple months back, we did a story about how in Arlington, Massachusetts, uh, between Arlington and Cambridge and into Belmont, I believe it was the town of Belmont, they wanted the catenary lines removed. The whole Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority has, well, actually two electrified bus lines. And some of the residents there wanted to change that particular bus line from the electric buses to diesel buses because you're sitting down folks all of you sit down. Right, lay it on us they wanted to change from electric buses to diesel buses because the overhead catenary lines are ugly so instead of ugly catenary lines they rather have freaking diesel buses running now in Cambridge, which was is the biggest town, you know, out of those three, Cambridge said, um, no, we're not going to approve this concept. So, and I believe Arlington went along with it as well. I, so I think it was kind of just Belmont sticking out. So there saying that they want to prove it? Down. If one of them said no, they can't do it. Yeah. Okay. And okay. Cambridge just, Cambridge does have, a, it's, it's a very densely populated town. Uh, the MBTA, as a matter of fact, even runs very few diesel buses through Cambridge. They're all uh, the CNG buses. Okay, okay. So because of the type of area that it is, there's no way the MBTA is going to uh, or the politicians are going to agree to pulling down the electric buses to replace them with diesel buses. It's, but how, how do you like that? You know, and that just goes along with what you were just saying, Jess. But it's it's the opposite of what's happening in San Francisco. Well, it's, well, it's aesthetics. Not- yeah, aesthetics. I mean, that shouldn't even, that's the problem. See, what my, my problem here, and I get so passionate about this particular issue, is because I feel like that, that that's a totally irresponsible thing to say. Like, you're, you're, you're taking your own aesthetic pleasure over, you're putting that over the environment, your, your local environment. And so I feel like that's just, it's the wrong way to look at things. It's and gonna while, just, while we were doing the shoot, I was looking at the, uh, at these overhead lines, I got a good look at them because I don't live in that area. I'm not familiar with these electric buses, but they, you know they just run on the street for regular four-wheeled buses, the same MBTA buses that you see that are diesel or CNG, but their engines retrofitted to where they run on electric instead of CNG or ga- or, or diesel. Um, but these overhead lines are what you would see with a light rail or a trolley system, you know, same same catenary lines. And I personally don't find them offensive or ugly or have an aesthetic problem with them. And if it's those overhead electric lines or diesel buses, I, I don't know how you could not say that this is a no-brainer. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and one of the things out here, I mean, you, like you said, it, it sounds like it's the opposite of what's going on. Um, on the East Coast, but but I don't think so. I think folks out here kind of have this weird, uh, there's skepticism about this. You know, it all stems from that Agenda 21, which is that that action plan of the United Nations. It's sustainable development, and uh, it came out of some conference they had back in in the early 90s about um, about curbing environmental you know emissions and stuff like that. 
But so a lot of people have really grabbed onto that and they're calling it a global conspiracy and they're forcing us, you know, to 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 move into these urban centers and things like that. And they've they're just taking the language that we've developed, not we, I shouldn't say we, but the people that are behind this initiative that, that they've developed, like the agencies and stuff, like they'll take something like anti-sprawl and they'll rename it and they'll say, well, that they're calling that dense urban concentrated communities. Cramming population is a, into close quarters. Well, you say smart growth, we say high density housing, mass transit land use control. So they're... They're just taking the the total opposite end of that spectrum and saying that by by being more sustainable about these communities, is it some kind of global conspiracy to get us all to to be forced into stacked apartment buildings and whatnot? Hmm. I mean, what do you guys think about that? I think it's a great idea. I mean, uh, the canary lines. I mean, that's a mi- really a minor issue because there is. I'm sure there's technology where you can run the power from, let's say, street level and put a, um, uh, a cantonary base like, like on a, Almost street. like a third rail. Almost like a third rail. But you'd, or, or, or feed it maybe even wirelessly if that's possible. I don't know what the technology is, but, I mean, the cantonary lines may look ugly to some people, but, I mean, they, should be, they, they, they used to have that in New York as well, and they took it down. And as for housing, just what's housing doing now? Is it multi-use buildings? Or are they going up? Or are they going, are they you know, are they going horizontal? Or are they going vertical? Is there that's, landfill and they're building condos on landfill? What's what is the housing situation? That's exactly what this whole Plan Bay area is about, and it's nicknamed One Bay Area right. uh, to kind of solidify all the counties because everybody's so spread apart that everybody has their own backyard, their own, you know, these large urban, these large sprawled out areas. What are you going to do, Jess, when they start building condos on all of those uh, vineyards that you enjoy? (laughs) I don't know if that's ever going to happen. They can't even get the high speed (laughs) rail to come through here. (laughs) Well, if you want to talk about cities being packed in, you should look at cities like Tokyo. I mean, they've got hotels where they're charging you Whatever it is, and the room that you have is like an eight foot, oh, you long, have like an eight foot long by eight. four foot wide cubicle. You slide into like you a literally cubicle. slide into the cubicle, right? Exactly. And I mean, they're, and they're paying the equivalent, say thirty or forty dollars a night, and your stuff is outside, and it it it, it, it puts a a hotel for five hundred people in a building that you, where you can house maybe eighty apartments. And of course, my figures, I don't know, but I've seen reports of this where these things are built like honeycombs, interlocked, and these people slide into these almost almost like uh, cocoons, they go to sleep, wake up next morning, go do what they got to do, because Japan had, they, the only place they can build is up, and they have no more room. Absolutely. Yeah. So now we, we yeah. you do have my interest between that audio clip and what you've been saying about this initiative and, and these issues that the senator is putting forth. What's So what is the state, either the cities or the state, looking to accomplish or ultimately do here? So uh, by by 2035, I think that's the goal, by the year 2035, that's what we're shooting for, to have this uh, sustainable community strategy in place, which actually is kind of like the blueprint for the Bay Area. That's what they're they're uh, calling it. It's it's where you live, work, and everything all within yep. your community. Yep. It's so in, you- in New Jersey, they had an experiment back in... what. Well, what was Radburn Fred in like the 40s or something built originally? Well, Radburn was it was in the 20s. In the 20s, okay, yeah. You know, in in the middle of Fairlawn, New Jersey, there's a separate little community called Radburn, which <laughs> was exactly what you're speaking of. Self-contained all community. Of, all of the houses circled around inner courtyards. You know, your kids would never have to leave the community. Everything, schools and everything were built in within the perimeter of this community. And you were able to leave your backyard, go down to a courtyard into a park, and the kids crossed the park to go to school. They never had to cross major streets. See, yeah, that was out of money. back in the 1920s, literally 100 years ago now. That one and, uh, and um, uh, Levittown, Long Island, is the same idea. That was designed by the same guy. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's the idea of sustainable, self-sustaining so what, community. So what goes around comes around. They did it 90 years ago, and now it looks like, you know, the Bay Area really wants to bring it into the 21st century. Yeah, and then a lot of people are really not happy about it because the the mentality out here is is to have your freedom. Well, I'm not happy that's, about that's it because what, it, it, it cramps your lifestyle. That's yeah. what happened 100 years ago. That's why Radburn didn't take off the way they anticipated it to. 
because too many people said no. It's, you know, this isn't what we want. Well, at the same time, at the time that Radburn was built in the 1920s, it wasn't, you know, the, the, the people commuting to New York wasn't like it. I mean, at the time, Fairlawn, I mean, my parents' home was built in 1948, 19 years after Radburn's conception. And it was built as a part of a something called the Brookside Developments, 15 miles outside of New York City. And people were concerned about commuting in. Now you've got, you know, over almost a million people living in that area alone. And this would have been a perfect concept now if it could be built. Yep, yep. That's the thing, and they want to l limit the amount of commuting that people actually are doing. And I think there's a there's a huge social aspect to this too, because I think the word community is so important to us, and we've lost a lot of that over the past, you know, I, I don't know what 30, 40 years here. You know, where we put all these highways in, and we've moved out to the burbs, and you know, we put up our fences and all of this stuff. And it's like I I just feel like as humans, we need to kind of get back to this community thing. It's so much healthier. Yeah, well, I don't know my neighbors, and they don't know me, and it's what <laughs> it's, I mean, there you go. That's the point. Because when I grew up in the neighborhood, we knew all the kids in the neighborhood. Sure. We hung out together. Yep. Now, I don't know my neighbors. I know a couple of them, that's it. And, that's, and for that's me, in, in the area just outside of Boston that I'm living in, we do know the neighbors. I know one, two, three, four, four neighbors right off the top of my head that I know them, they know me. So I'm in the type of community where, luckily, and I, and I do like that, you yeah. know, the neighbors still do know each other. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not talking about, friends. you know, these, these aren't multi-use houses. These are, the area that I'm in are all single-family houses. So it's, okay. you know, all of these single-family houses in a residential community, you know your neighbors. But you're also in an area, and getting back to the what, what Jess was talking about, you're in an area that where you can commute into the city because the MBTA happens to do a very good job of covering the suburbs and the outskirts of Boston. Oh, absolutely. Unlike, as, as, unlike, as unlike the York, where, you know, you have the, I, my father has, my father used to have to walk four blocks to the bus. I got to drive a, a mile and a half to the train. You know, there yeah. wasn't any kind of, a, of an internal um, uh, mass transit system in the area where I lived. No, and that that's, that's the case throughout the country, in towns and cities even, outside of major metropolitan areas. You know, New York City has the biggest, and in some people's minds, the best transit system. Boston's is very good. San Francisco's is very good. L.A. is growing in leaps and bounds. Like I said earlier, they're putting light rail back in to where they ripped it out 80 years ago. Yeah. Uh, all major metropolitan areas have that. Unfortunately, Fred, you're just not in a major metropolitan area. So, you know, we're talking apples and oranges. with. Oh, no, I understand that. But... Yeah, I just don't know how anybody can get, get angry or, or criticize this, this initiative. No, I, I mean, understand people want to stop this. I know. I, I think it sounds so great. It sounds so smart. I mean, for lack of a better word, that's the, that's the buzzword that they've been using. But people are just like... I've been to some of the community meetings that um, these agencies have been holding where they survey folks and they actually do like a, they do like a Sim City kind of thing. It's something different, but it's like a Sim City where they show you different scenarios and I then you can build this up. Yeah, and vote on things. What would you like? And it's all about give and take. It's like, well, you know, you have to understand that you may have to give up this in order to have this and, you know, really making the people understand. And there's folks that come in to these meetings. They're, they call themselves the Minutemen. They're, they're they're tea partiers, basically. Yeah. Um, and they come in just with the purpose of disrupting the meetings. Yep. They disrupt it. They try to break it down. They ask stupid, stupid questions. And then the thing they that gets me is that in an area like Ed's at, all right, Ed's not giving up much. I mean, if he needs a car for the day, he can go to his, his hourly rental car place, get the car for two, three hours, and go back and continue on a mass transit. And I like that idea because the availability of the car is there if you need it. But yep. if you don't need it, you don't need a vehicle. And most of us would love to live that way if we could. Yeah. But the idea behind other... that is the ability to get that car and when you need it, but you don't have to have the insurance, the garage space. You can, you know, if, if you can walk a block and a half to the bus, walk the block and a half, get the bus, and, and when you need the car, you have the car. It's a great yep. idea. Yep, yep. And it's about sharing, too. It's about, you know, we need to, to get away from this individualist thing because it's wasteful. That's right. No need for it. So, yeah, Jess, what I'd like to see is for About the Bay that you follow up on this whole initiative and go into more detail on it and put together a little 20-minute expose program. And while we're talking about About the Bay, why don't you take this as an opportunity to discuss the 
San Francisco area version of our About series. And I, I should, before Jess just explains that, uh, most of our listeners have probably seen or seen and listened to online our promotional video for About the Bay or for our About series that's out there now. And that was Jessica that uh, narrated that uh, mm-hmm. promo. So, Jess, you did a great job she on that. You did a great job. So, tell us about the Bay and what we might see coming up. Well, uh, I definitely would like to go into a little more detail about this global conspiracy called One Bay Area and our sustainable <laughs> communities strategy. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff going on in the Bay Area. I love San Francisco. It's been so cool. I've been living out here for two years now, and I'm really happy to be contributing to BaseNet Internet Television with some footage of what's going on out and about the Bay. We're looking forward to our holiday special coming up again, and you, you did coverage from San Francisco last year, and I'm yep. sure we could expand on that this year. And oh yeah, I'm gonna be visiting. Uh, I'm gonna be visiting the uh, local farmers markets and checking out the Ferry Building Farmers Market in downtown San Francisco. Um, and yeah, we're gonna we're gonna hear what some more folks out here have to say. Excellent, that'll be great. Well, oh, I can't wait to see it. Awesome, thank you very much. Oh, it's and, been fabulous. And you know, you're welcome here on, as we see it, anytime you want to. Thank you. So you're and, one. Of the, I guess that makes her one of the wees, huh? That's it. One of the wees. So, Fred, yeah. that just about ends it. Did we happen to lose anybody this week? Is this is normally how we end the show? Yeah, we lost a race car driver, Dan Weldon. Oh, that's right. Yep, that was just on Sunday or so. What's today? Today's Tuesday. Yeah, that Today's was Tuesday, Sunday. Yeah. Uh, Dan Weldon, uh, one of IndyCar's most popular stars. Uh, I believe Dan was only about 32 years old. He had a wife and at least one child. Uh, died in what they call a spectacular 15-car accident uh, in IndyCar. Now, IndyCar, remember, isn't like NASCAR. They're not the full cars. Uh, the they kind of they kind of look like those little go-kart kind of things uh, with the open cockpits and everything. Uh, well, this was uh, the video is all over the place. If anybody's morbid and wants to see it, it really was a spectacularly uh, horrendous crash. And, uh, you know, so we're just mourning the loss. He was a seven-time champion. Uh, this was in Las Vegas, the Mo- Las, Las Vegas, Vegas Motor Speedway for the GoDaddy $5 million challenge. For those people who don't know it, Indy cars do reach speeds of over 225 miles an hour. On very small ovals. It's a very yeah. short track as opposed to NASCAR. So. so, yeah, so there you go. Dan Weldon, this one's for you and for your family. Okay, Fred, so I guess that just about does it. Yeah, the only thing we have to do is we have to name our executive producer for oh, the show. Oh, okay. Did we have one this week? Yeah, we do. We're going to name Ed Sorensen, one of our Facebook people who's been helping us out by posting a lot of uh, a lot of BaseNet stuff on the uh, on Facebook through uh, social media. So, Ed, sure the show's your show, and you're the executive producer. Ed, yep. Thank you very much for post, reposting. I just all posted them. Posts. There you go. Keep it up. And while we're talking about social media, you can follow us on Facebook as at BaseNet. On Twitter, we are at BaseNet TV. Okay. And our website is BaseNet.co. On YouTube, youtube.com slash BaseNet Network. We are all over the place. Enjoy our videos. Enjoy our audio podcasts. We're also on iTunes. Just search for BaseNet on iTunes. And from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, on a Tuesday, show number 12.B, I'm Ed Jupin. And from Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, in the beautiful Pocono Mountains, I'm Fred Boaz. And from northern Silicon Valley, is that what we're calling it? Oh, you're John C. <laughs> Dvorak? Oh, oh no, that, that's in the morning. In, well, in the morning, John, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> From Berkeley, California, I'm Jessica Moskowitz. We'll see you next time.